We really think about things, not just in the, the built form, but how they impact the communities. And, and not all architecture firms think about that. Business of Architecture, episode 374. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking with B. Rarawala, who is the Vice President and Director of Corporate Brand Strategy and Communications at CRTKL. Now, she recently joined the LA office and she centered her 20-year career around the nexus of design thinking and business strategy. She actually holds a degree in economics and she's not formally trained as an architect, so she brings brings a very deep insight and specialist way of looking at where the world of design and business intersect, which made this conversation deeply, deeply fascinating. She's the past president of the South California Development Forum. She sits on the USC Architecture Guild Board, and she is currently part of the USC Economics Leadership Council. So her role at CRTKL means that she basically represents the brand at a firm-wide level and she's seeking to align their message and the message of the business with the marketing strategy, the business goals and the opportunities for shared initiatives. She's also responsible for the creation of strategic initiatives and bringing those objectives into a meaningful internal and external communications strategy. So sit back, relax and enjoy Be Rara Walla. Today's episode is sponsored by Sweet Process. Are you frustrated with how long it takes to get stuff done in your architecture firm or with how chaotic or confusing things seem to get? Well, then let me tell you about a much better way of getting work done and let me tell you about an amazing tool that will help you overcome the frustrating log jams in your architecture firm. Sweet Process is a simple but powerful tool that lets you create clear step-by-step instructions for every task in your architecture firm, from onboarding new clients to training employees to responding to client requests. So everything gets done more easily and more reliably. Plus, you'll have a central place where everyone who works with you, your employees, contractors, and even virtual assistants can access your procedures anytime from any device. The best way to understand how Sweet Process streamlines your work is to start using it. The company offers a 14-day free trial, but as a loyal listener of this podcast, you can try for 28 days free of charge. You don't even have to enter a credit card to get started. Just navigate to www.sweetprocess.com forward slash BOA to start your free 28-day trial today. B. Welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Good. Lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Now, you are the Principal and Director of Corporate Brand Strategy at CRTKL. Um, you've had a, a really interesting career. You're, you're LA-based. Um, and I guess my first question is, how did, you, how, how, did, how did your route to becoming principal, how did that happen? Yeah, it's a, a kind of interesting story. I'm not an architect. I'm not trained in architecture. I have a degree in economics. So that makes obviously the most sense to join an architecture firm. Um, but I've always kind of operated. I have a, a design background as well and have just always surrounded myself with design. So I knew personally in my career that I would be gravitating towards a creative industry. Yeah. And the built environment is just something that I've always been really passionate about. And so for the two decades I've spent my career, it's all been at architecture firms or design related um, to architecture, like environmental graphics, what have you. So um, as I have kind of navigated my career, I've always sat kind of in the um, cross between the practice and the business side. So having my hand in the creative and working with clients is something I've always been really passionate about as well. But, you know, knowing my background and having that economic acuity to understand, you know, the way market shift has been really advantageous as, you know, architecture, you don't typically get the business side in your scholastic training, right? It's- Absolutely. That's kind of a big missing piece, if you like. So it's, it's very interesting to, to hear people who have kind of had the discipline and the training of business and moving into a role in an architecture practice and also having the kind of, you know, what's it like working with architects? As a, as a non-architect? Well, I guess, you know, I've, I've been exposed. My, my father was a car designer and as an industrial designer, it's a okay. very, very similar uh, 
kind of sense of being as an architect. So I think I've just kind of known that um, my whole life. But, you know, there's a seriousness to architecture and the, the iterative process of design um, sometimes, you know, gets people always always thinking there's never an end. And obviously on the business side, you want an end point, you want to move on to the next. So I think it, it creates nice discourse to have this understanding and empathy of what they want to achieve through design, mm -hmm. but also like this is a business, this isn't a charity. We want to, you know, do things that are meaningful and powerful and impact, you know, the earth in a positive way, but yeah. we also need to make money <laughs> to do that. So, um, you know, I like to say I balance those two, you know, attributes quite well. That's that's really it's really interesting actually. Uh, I remember I remember when I worked at a, at Grimshaw years ago, and one of the the company lawyers we had, they hired us a team of lawyers to work for the business to do contracts, and she said one of the most interesting things she found about architects was that they're not they're not doing it for the money. Is 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 that a perception that you've experienced that? You know, I think it depends on who in the practice. I think, of course, it's a passion and it's like art. When I was doing my own photography, it was hard for me to sell my work, you know, mm -hmm. and I, so I understand that very, you know, wholly that it's hard to separate something that's innately, you know, dr you are driven by this mm -hmm. and to think about it as a means to make money, right? But I think as you evolve in the practice, you start to understand and, you know, as you mature, like, you have to continue to do, especially these really large scale projects that CRTKL takes on. That is something you're only afforded when you can manage you know, a, a, a project really well. Yeah. So, you know, that, that balance comes into play. I personally wish that, you know, in schools, they're teaching more of the business side because I think that will kind of expedite people's careers a bit faster mm -hmm. um, because I think there is an advantage for those people that balance those, the creative with the business, you know, side of their brain, they advance sometimes faster in an organization. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily fair, right? Because someone with the design talent and an acuity for understanding, they can advance to design principle, but I think it's a longer road sometimes. So having that balance from an early age is something, you know, I wish that there could be more influence on. I think in the, you know, North, oh, sorry, in, in North America with NCARB, it's pretty prescriptive. Yes. And so that's just something that, you know, it would take a lot, but it's something I think that should be explored. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the feeling is very much here, the same in the, in the UK as, as well, that, you know, the, the, there's a, a lot missing in architectural education and the fact that we don't discuss the business elements, we don't discuss money. You know, it's rare that you design a project to a budget at university and you're in university for a long period of time. That kind of warps what your perception of what good architecture actually is. And yeah, and, and constructability too, I think, is what, something that maybe has been not lost, but it's certainly the exploration, the conceptual aspect of the businesses, uh, well, of the practice is really focused on in school. Mm -hmm. And it's not about that complete life cycle of, okay, but it has to be the code. It has to, and some of it is there, but I think that's, you know, a lost art too, is the technical architect is not always put on the same pedestal as the design architect. And, and there is that balance to see the life of a, a project. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so how would you describe your role? What does your, what is your role? How does it, how does it differ from the, the, the other principles uh, in the practice? Uh, yeah, and, I can. and perhaps to answer that as well, perhaps you could, you could give a bit of a, a 30,000 foot view of CRTKL uh, as well. Yeah, uh, that's, it's a great question because I kind of created the role in conversations with uh, the former CEO. Um, you know, uh, the gr big picture is we're, you know, set up as a matrix organization. So we're practice, the market meets the marketplace. And um, it's really interesting. I think in pre a previous life, it was more practice driven. And we found that there's a disconnect if you're not engaged with your local offices. And so the, the company has evolved to really be quite complex, to cover like the global nature of our firm. Mm -hmm. um, but so there's the practices which really lead the thought leadership. And then there's the offices that drive the culture and also drive the technical execution of the projects. And they work quite um, well together. And I've really seen that grow even in the last year that I've been here. 
Um, and so my role, you know, I look at it part, where are we going? How are we expanding? What, what it, are we looking at that's driving the practice? And so we have some key initiatives, um, well-being, uh, human-centric design, technology, mobility, and resiliency. And those are kind of the core drivers between the practice areas. So each practice touches them, but it's where they also can come together. And we really see that's influencing the world we're in. And so I get to be a part of driving those for the organization. Also, you know, looking at our external message, what is our competition? How are we speaking, you know, aligned? How are we separating ourselves? So working really closely with the director of marketing to drive that message, working closely with, you know, the executive leadership team to kind of pinpoint what is that future facing perspective of the firm. So it's a really exciting role. I get to have my hands in quite a bit. <laughs> and I like that. I like the diversity of thought. I don't see myself ever kind of being as linear as it's, it's a formal role. It's an interesting role, and the, the, the title is interesting, the corp, uh, you know, corporate brand strategy, and it's not necessarily something that many architects would uh, associate with a role that goes into an architecture practice. Um, in, in terms of the scale of the practice, and for people who haven't come across uh, CRTKL before, can you give us a little bit of a, of, a, of a global picture of how the business operates and how it's kind of structured Certainly. So we have, gosh, I think about 14 offices. I might be wrong on the exact number, but we are largely North American based. That's our biggest hub. We have a very strong practice in APAC, which is largely um, China based, but we have a, a, an affiliate office in the Philippines as well. Um, and then we have our uh, MENA group, which is really focused in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And then we have our UK based group, which covers into Europe as well. And that's in London and Manchester. So we're really truly a global organization and we work pretty much around the world. I mean, we tried to do, I think as our, it's our 75th anniversary this year. And as part of that, we were trying to catalog, you know, get those metrics of how many countries have we touched? And it's pretty much almost every one of them. We've definitely touched, you know, the major, major countries, um, really touched almost all the states um, in the U.S. So, you know, it's not just about the locations we're in. We serve a much broader range and, and we have, you know, a breadth of practice areas, uh, largely corporate, although we have kind of diversified that. And that's something that, you know, I look to push forward to is that diversification, but residential, workplace, healthcare. Um, obviously, we're known for our retail and mixed use group. Um, and I'm forgetting many other practices. <laughs> There's so many are what we're rooted in, though, is um, is urban planning. And I think that's right. something that sets us apart is we really think about things, not just in the, the built form, but how they impact the communities and and not all architecture firms think about that. So I think that's a really unique attribute that's really been with us since the inception of the firm. Got it. And now your role um, in corporate brand strategy, does this only apply to the office that you're in or does it you know you're kind of involved in making sure that that brand is cohesive internationally yeah I think you know that's it's a great question in terms of you know how how this manifests itself right but I really am someone who believes in the glue the power of the global practice and I don't want us to be you know focused just on our locations. I want us to be hyper-local in the sense that we know our communities and we serve our communities. That's that great piece of, I think, impact that only happens at that local level. But, you know, I'm looking at that really the 30,000 foot view of how do we come together and how are we mobilizing as one unit, so to mm. speak. And I think that's really, it's an interesting challenge because, you know, there are regional specificities that you can't break away from. You have to understand cultural nuance, but you also have to pair that with the breadth and depth of our firm. And I think that comes together and coalesces the storytelling is really powerful when you weave all of the parts together, right? Mm -hmm. Versus, you know, just just here or just there. Well, how, yeah, how do you, how do you manage to kind of stop the brand from fragmenting? And, and, and obviously like when you're working in places like the Middle East or, you know, in Dubai, for example, where you need to have a local partner who's going to take 50% of the, 
of the business. I don't know if that's still the case, but it certainly was years back. And also in, in places like China, where you have to actually, you know, to have a business there, you need to basically be a partner with the state or the province that mm-hmm. you're in. Um, so all these kind of forces then pulling on on the brand. Yeah, design, design, build partnerships, what have you. I think, you know, the power of our firm is that people do know who we are mm-hmm. and where we are not known as well. You know, that that connection back to that identity is so important. Mm-hmm. And, you know, trying to reinvent yourself is not going to solve anything if you don't kind of leverage what we have. I think making it unique and specific is still important and you know goes back to my earlier point of understanding that cultural nuance and um you know driving that refining that message but overall it's really tying back and and saying like look this is who we are and if you know and you're confident in who we are as Mm -hmm. you know as each uh principal of the firm should yeah um i think it's an easier sell you know, I think that it shows we, we work agnostically in terms of location. You know, it's you could be in Los Angeles working on projects in China one day. You could be working on projects on the East Coast or in the Middle East. It's really collaborative. And I, I like that. There's many other firms that are much more territorial or profit center driven. And I think that does a disservice for collaboration, for growing talent. You get to experience so much at the firm. And I think that's a really exciting you know, part of CRTKL's culture. Well, that that's really that is really interesting. How does how does that work, sort of on a practical level, in terms of, you know, if you guys set up a practice or a new firm in in Dubai, but then there's team members who might be scattered across other locations. Yeah, I think you know the virtual environment is something we were you know, before the pandemic even utilizing. And granted, a lot more happened with flying before, but we've proven, hey, we can work this way. And and sometimes it's a 24-hour cycle, yeah. but we bring the best talent needed for a project. So that could be anywhere. If we have a residential, um, you know, community that's let's say in South America, but our residential experts are sitting in Los Angeles or Dallas or mm-hmm. or the UK, we'll bring those talents who know that. Uh, typology and then bring that forward for the client to serve the client. And I think then it's either through partnership with our local, you know, architecture firm or understanding who's going to execute that. We, we make those smart decisions to ensure that, you know, the integrity of what we're designing is executed. How do you decide when to move into a new territory or, or, or uh, I suppose this, this goes to a wider conversation of like, how do you, how are you identifying opportunities and, and then how do you kind of pounce on them basically? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think a lot of it is rooted in our practice areas. So how they see their market shifts and the analysis of each practice area will start to kind of define where that expansion goes. I think we need to be very strategic you know, in the past, it might have happened that there was a project opportunity or someone moves and relocates and that's how you kind of found an office. I think that's not how we're, you know, being a founder of an office these days. <laughs> you have to be much more strategic. There's too much competition. Um, but, you know, now we're really looking at to really kind of understand the uh kind of how and why we're driving marketplace decisions. I think it really is how much volume is there? Where are clients going? What is the, you know, the market bearing? We can't just set up shop in a reactionary fashion for one opportunity. You know, we might have a project office that serves a few projects, but to really move into that market, it would take more, probably more than one practice area to mm-hmm. do that. And it's really, again, that that strategy that we've really put in place. And, and Marissa Tasho, our director of marketing, is doing a great job of kind of advancing that client tiering and and identifying you know where we see the market going got it and what sorts of activities or roles are involved in identifying the a kind of evolving marketplace you know i think a bit this is what i love about it is you know the economic forces right at the for the, the, the root of it it's you know what are we needing what are we seeing um and there's a bit of you know talking to our clients obviously clients are expanding as well i think you know paying attention to on the client side mergers and acquisitions as well because you'll start to see that you know 
uh, divestiture and, and investing in, you know, certain areas where they're seeing hot markets. So, you know, it's, it's the business side, right? And that's mm-hmm. the part that I really love is kind of how do we best identify that? I think we do a good job. Can we do better? Certainly, I think, you know, leveraging economists, leveraging the business uh, acumen of non-traditional, you know, players in architecture is actually something that um, some of the bigger, more sophisticated firms are doing. They obviously have that broader ability to do that. You know, it's harder for a small practice to do that, but it's also, you know, a small practice doesn't have many mouths to be. So it's, you know, it's an economy of scale in a way, right? How you're going to be searching that out. But um, I do think it has a lot to do with, you know, understanding the markets of, you know, true economic forces but, so was starting there. Was your role a role that, that um, CRT, KL were actively looking for? for- um, you know, they were looking for the communications aspect. I know that, but um, I had met the former C- CEO, Kelly, um, through a board that we both sat on. And we just had great conversations. And she was really, you know, set on advancing the firm. And Kim has done a great job, you know, picking that up in, in her appointment and carrying that forward. And, and so those conversations kind of culminated in kind of crafting a role. So I don't think it was necessarily exactly how they uh, envisioned it, but yeah. together we kind of crafted it and came together because um, you know, I'm not, I'm not a journalist. I'm not a PR expert. So the, the communication side was not something I wholly know. And I, I'm the first to admit that I have many people on my team that are brilliant at it. And so I defer to them. Um, but, you know, for me, it's that overall point of view, right? And I think that's where that like brand identity goes is understanding, um, you know, how to advance a message for an architectural practice. That's what I get. And I understand the the market side. I mean, at the root, I'm, and my heart, I'm a business developer. You know, it's like, I like to win jobs. I like to, you know, seize opportunities. That's, that's fun. The kind of game theory behind it is great, right? (laughs) It's, it's a not hunt and kill because I could never (laughs) hunt or kill anything but that kind of you know in the project world it's kind of exciting so could you could you walk us through the process that um crtkl will go through in i won't say hunt and killing but in in terms of like you know like in terms of landing landing a juicy project i think it's you know first we've been fortunate to maintain our reputation right like that's something that you have to do um And we're really committed to advancing on that as well, not just resting on our laurels, but the thought leadership and and thinking about the future. It's funny, there was a kind of a future of aviation piece that we did. It was, uh, I think it was part of the future of malls, actually, because we're such at the forefront of like shopping and entertainment districts. And so they put a piece together about kind of how drones will work. And it's like this Amazon case study that's happening now is what we thought about in 2016. And so like this, you know, urban mobility is something we were talking about so long ago. We were so ahead of the game. And so it's that type of iterative nature of uh, questioning and bringing to the forefront new ideas. I think that sets us apart and clients are looking for that. And also we have these conversations with our clients, like, where do you want to go? We understand and listen to our clients. And I think that's really important because we do have, you know, very long-standing relationships and we've evolved with them as they've evolved and, you know, pressing issues, you know, have changed. And, you know, I think the pandemic, I was saying this um, earlier, it's really acted as an accelerator for certain things. And I think everyone's seen the economic impact, the environmental impact, the social impact of, you know, the times. And I think our clients are, you know, aware of that too. And they're shifting, they're shifting their models to be supportive of that cause and the urgency that we have um, today. Right. And so we're, we're aligned with that. And it's actually a really nice time because there's a lot of convergence on ideas that maybe weren't there a few years ago, especially in terms of, I think, the environment as well. That's really, uh, you know, kind of that ESG is really coming to the forefront of even the biggest, um, Mm -hmm. you know, corporations across the globe. Now, you you were saying the practice has got, um, you know, a 75-year history and 
there's been some very long standing relationships with clients. What, what are the sorts of life cycles or life spans of a relationship with some of your longest standing clients? Oh gosh, it's, it's been decades. And, you know, I'm probably not as well versed to speak on like the legacy. Cause you know, all of, all of my 12 months of being here, I don't, I don't quite know all the nuance of relationships, but seeing kind of that repeat, we were tracking like kind of our 75 legacy projects. And I know one is, you know, LA live, which we did quite a few years ago. I was actually in college seeing that project being developed. Um, and, you know, we're still working with AEG, like that's a great relationship. So, you know, it's, it's important when we can make these projects that are catalysts for development that spur beyond just that project, even though we may not be attached to everything around it, it spurs the development. Um, I think that's where clients keep coming back to us. And actually something that we've been um, focusing on is uh, with Sarah Wicker, who's leading our research group. Um, she just put together with her team these impact studies to actually show and quantify and do the research on the impact of our planning of our projects for yeah. the communities that they serve. And it's been a really powerful testament to how we uh, plan the foresight we have, but also just the, the positive impact that we're making in the communities. Um how much of the, you know, going back to the sort of 75 years, for example, the the original vision and mission of the the founders there, how much of that is still intact or how much of it is, or how, how is it involved? And how, does, think, and, and how does that kind of, how does that 75 year history now play into, you know, the brand and the, and the, the kind of narrative around the around yeah it's kind of a beautiful thing where the urban planning aspect has been there like that right. has been this through line that has been there and and i mean there were patents we actually had a, a recent passing last year of one of the original founders the the k and the mm -hmm. crtkl and you know he patented light fixtures and there's just like these type of innovations and commitment to community i think has been uh, pervasive in a really positive way throughout our history and and it plays out in that community aspect that we're really thinking beyond one building or one development and that greater impact. Got it. Uh, and in, in terms of the, like how you document that history or how kind of current it is, is there a lot of looking back or yeah, I think, I, you know, this the 75 year anniversary has really prompted kind of a reflection. Mm -hmm. I think, too, it's also a platform to spring forward. I think, you know, you don't want to kind of uh, linger in the past. You'll get, you know, overtaken by everyone around you. And so it's this nice balance of acknowledging the legacy, acknowledging what we've done, seeing and quantifying the impact that we make and building on that and saying, now what? What can we do for the next 75 years and beyond? And I think that's something that really excites us, especially, you know, as I mentioned, with the convergence of how our clients are thinking. It's a really unique time to capitalize on this shift of you know, going from more, I think, traditional architectural service to this trusted advisory role. And I think that's that arc and position that we've taken is we need to be much more research driven, data driven to advance what our clients are looking for. They're seeking out a partner to really help them shape their communities that they serve. And, and so that alignment has allowed us to really broaden our reach. And it's no longer just, a you know, turning over a set of, of drawings anymore, right? It's, it's this bigger, you know, social environmental issue that we can address. How, how over that 75 year period, you know, this is one thing that a lot of architecture practices uh, or firms go through is their succession planning. How does the next group of leaders in the business, how are they cultivated? How are they trained? How do they take over? You know, how has uh, CRTKL been nurturing that process? I think it, in part, it's identified through the practice areas. You know, they have their teams and they're mentoring and building within the practices. But the office leaders also have identified, you know, who is that talent in office? And so it's happening at two levels. I think, you know, we are working on even a more formal process of 
training that next uh, generation and getting those leaders up to speed. But what's nice is to see, you know, across the industry, we always have those like 30 under 30s and 40 under 40s. We have a lot of those people that are, you know, in our firm already, and they're looked at as industry leaders. And, mm -hmm. and so they may not be a principal yet, but they are on that track and they are already making so much um, headway. I, I, you know, we just published a report through our research group called CoLabs and they, they talked about the circular economy and uh, kind of fixture and material reuse for retail because there's such a, you know, trends happen, how you carry to store, the, what are those fixtures doing? you know, once they are taken down. And Yarden, who led that collab, she she's young and just, she took on, she was working also on our Just label. So she's advanced a lot of the social cause um, of our practice. And, you know, we, we work with her at a senior level to engage and, and she's leading these efforts. And so I think it's those type of, you know, people who emerge and have a passion and a conviction, we love to celebrate that and work with them to help shape that discourse and thought leadership for the firm. So I, I think it's a little bit, we're trying to formalize it more on our end as yeah. leaders, but we're also seeing that, you know, if someone raises their hand, we, we gladly engage. So, you know, it, it has to happen, I think, on both sides, both uh, kind of a formality and informality of it. Great, great. Um, how many people are there in the practice in the firm? Oh like, gosh, worldwide. Just to give a guess. I think like a, oh. about, and now I, I'm going to botch the number, but probably around 1,200 people. 1,200. So okay. A, a, yeah, a good, a good amount. We're you know definitely one of the larger firms, um, but certainly not the biggest. But we have a really big breadth and you know yep. spread. I think geographically, which is interesting. Not all have, they might have like the same amount of people, but in a uh, more concentrated geography. So it, which ones are the biggest sort of offices? And do you have kind of little offices that maybe only have five or six and operate like a little micro practice? And then um, some of our project offices might have that, but really right. our offices, I think the smallest would have about like 30, 40 people. Um, okay. LA is a large office. Dallas is a very large office. DC is a very large office. Um, Dubai, uh, Beijing and Shanghai are large offices and then kind of the medium sized offices would be London, Chicago, um, Baltimore, uh, Miami. I'm like, now I'm going to like miss someone. They're going to be like, you didn't call me. <laughs> <this list." laughs> we, I we're tried. I get them in the post edit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Amazing. But, yeah, so like our biggest tubs will have over 100 people. And, you know, I sit in one of them. LA is a big one. So, so I've said LA a lot. I feel like this is already biased. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm I, think that, too much. I think it's fair. That's fair. It's, it's your immediate surroundings. So you're, you're right. biased. You're, which, you're of which I would. Yeah, of which I was in the office all of like two weeks before we went to virtual. <laughs> so, you know, as much as I'm like playing to the home team, my my home there was not very long. <laughs> <laughs> how how so how do you guys communicate internally then? So with twelve hundred people, obviously you're now getting into the realm of, you know, big business. Uh, and again, for an architecture firm it's huge. Like, yeah. uh, but in terms of, in terms of business, it's not, it's still not massive, right? You know, yeah. when, when you look at things. Yeah. Like uh, our clients, you know, we have these great big company clients that like we are, you know, this much, we might be one of their offices. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I am actually really surprised that we have engaged so well in a virtual format. And I say right. that knowing the other firms I've worked at for and how it just felt so natural to transition. And I think that is because of, you know, I said earlier kind of work, you know, location agnostic where it's just, we are kind of used to communicating across time zones. Um, I definitely have started my day a lot earlier to communicate with my team because not many of them are LA based. Um, but I think it's, you know, really been interesting that, you know, in a way the virtual environment has forced in a, in a really positive way better communication. I think we're all, you know, in the beginning, not everyone would turn on their cameras. Now, like, you know, people are just, it's, everybody's used to it. I think there's something to be said for just really, um, you know, 
kind of jumping on a quick call. Sometimes there's too many calls. I'll be the first to admit, like maybe we can scale all of those back, but I feel like we're connecting more. And it was really surprising to me that I, you know, for only a year in, I've touched a lot of the offices and been able to communicate and connect and see that work. It's, it's been really reaffirming to say that, you know, we're, we're doing a really good job. Um, Sure. Can we improve? Of course. But I think overall, the, the caliber of work that's still being produced and the commitment to our clients, it's all very uh, much at the forefront of our minds and, and balancing all, all the, you know, the, the dogs barking, the cats coming across the screen, the kids screaming, it's all been, it's all been working. I have a child that likes to interrupt a, a lot of conversation. So. Is, is it something <laughs> that, that you see the practice um, maintaining over the next you know, as, as a working kind of a way of my, a way of working. And then. Yeah, I, I do. I, I, we have actually always had a, um, a culture of being able to be remote and have a flexible work schedule. It was never obviously as formal as this. Um, I mean, the policy was there, but I don't think everyone took advantage of it in the, mm-hmm. in the ways that they could. Um, but I see us really being much more flexible. And I, I know we haven't really set our return to office um, policies for North America yet. We are offices in China have gone back. They're fully, you know, back in office. Um, But I think it's, you know, people understand that, you know, I can, I can work really effectively sometimes away, but there are those times when you want to collaborate and you want to charrette and sketch together and ideate together. So I think, you know, going back to that, people will be, you know, craving that and probably wanting that, but to say, oh, I have to be in an office from, you know, nine to five or nine to whenever. Um, I think that kind of thinking is probably gone by the wayside. Got it. That's, that's, that's very interesting to, to hear how the many businesses at the moment are kind of adapting and what they're going to retain in terms of working practices. And yeah, yeah and when you've got such a strong culture, how does that get maintained in the, in the digital environment? Yeah. And, and, you know, there are challenges. I mean, I think there's, you know, the burnout, the fatigue, right. That is something that has happened real. And, you know, I think people will want to return back just to have a sense of like, you know, catching up like the water cooler talk or, or just popping over, you know, my, my favorite part about being in, in the, you know, business of architecture is to see work being created, right? Like just lean over someone's desk and have hover as they're like creating this amazing model. And, you know, I don't have that exposure anymore. And like, I miss that. I know that. Um, And I think others miss that too, because I think that's how those like great kind of happy, you know, um, kind of collisions of ideas come together to create new things. It's that, oh, what are you working on there? Oh, I could apply this to my project. Wait, let's talk about this. And like, all of a sudden, you're creating the next new thing. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I, I'm impressed that that's still happening, but I don't think it's happening as uh, unintentionally, right, where right. you just have that, like, you know, chance collision that I think is so powerful about being in the office. In in your role, what is your kind of formal interaction, if you like, with architects? Um, I I try to reach out to them as much as possible. You know, I I miss, like I said, like just popping in in charrettes or where you're, you know, kind of doing a review or a pen up. Like I miss that part. But I think, you know, I'm I'm definitely talking to more of the senior level mm-hmm. architects. You know, the the kind of the design principles and uh, practice area leaders, um, because you know that's where I'm gleaning my information for, from. But I I hope that as we kind of transition back, that I'll have that kind of you know, connection back to all levels. Um, Now it's kind of those people that are reaching out and want to engage and, you know, want to have that discourse, then I can communicate with them. But um, yeah, I think, you know, and I I attend some of the practice area meetings, which that helps too, because that's the whole practice and, Mm -hmm. and you get a better sense and getting involved with the office meetings, then I can have those, uh, you know, connections, but it's definitely not as uh, frequent as it would be, I think, in the office. Got it. Got it. How, how does, um, I mean, it's, it's very unusual for an architect practice to be, I know, you know, CR, uh, CRT, KL are not, they're not the ones directly floated on the stock market, but Arcadis are. Does that public, you know, having shareholders and that kind of different accountability, does that filter through to the architecture practice? 
Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we have our quarterly updates, our performance is measured as part of theirs. So, you know, there is a little bit more probably onus and, you know, outward facing um, data that not every architecture firm has to go under and, and, you know, being held to the quarterly cycle versus more of an annual cycle can have its pluses and minuses, obviously, as projects really flow beyond, um, you know, a quarter, but um, no, I think I think we've really found ways to be um, partners, and they're really supporting us as we advance. And I think that's you know that's the part that um, I like to focus on is that even though there are challenges with mm-hmm. you know it's not traditional for how I guess you know in America right how an architecture practice, when you think of these boutique practices emerge, you think of like all of a sudden you're going to be traded on a, a stock exchange, right? But um, but it happens and that's okay. You know, it's just, it's a different way of doing business and you you adjust. Amazing. Amazing. Um, I, I also noticed that you, you're serving on as a, the president of the South California Development Forum. Can you tell us a little bit about... I, I, about I what that just is. turned off, so I'm uh, past president this year okay, now. So you've just retired. <laughs> yeah, just I'm still on the executive committee. It's a really great uh, nonprofit. Um, we actually have a really phil- strong philanthropic arm where we um, give money to uh, charities of the board's choosing, mm-hmm. but really it's about discourse. Um, uh, on the built environment. And so development takes many forms, whether it's um, policy, whether it's in higher education, whether it's in aviation, like all the different kind of markets that um, architects play in, but it's also beyond just architecture. So land use attorneys can attend and and engineers and contractors. It's really um, kind of a a broad reach of all aspects of development. And it's been interesting because the kind of pivot away from being in person and being virtual, we've been able to expand kind of our, the breadth of our topics that we're talking about. We had a really interesting panel on the future of aviation. We talked about, you know, what is urban mobility looking like these days and, and, you know, autonomous flying vehicles, uh, just like all these different, it was like such a an incredible conversation and and the root of the conversation was about sustainable mobility really at the root and so the, it was interesting to see even you know what you think of an industry being such like a, a you know carbon abuser I guess you could say <laughs> that they're really thinking about um, you know what is the right path forward for the environment so again it's interesting it kind of goes back to the idea of the convergence you're seeing that even these markets that typically weren't um, you know maybe aligned with kind of our mission and values that they are converging and they're talking about the similar topics that you know their environmental equity is really important to all of us. Brilliant. And so what's what's next for the rest of 2021 and uh, CRTKL? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, celebrating our 75th is a big portion. I think really advancing topics are, you know, kind of pushing forward on our initiatives. You know, what what does it look like to have a total well-being across all of our practice areas? Like we know what it looks like in health. We've seen kind of, uh, you know, emergence of in hospitality and residential, but what does it really look like for everyone? What does, you know, true resiliency look like and how do we shepherd that? Not just from an environmental standpoint, but socioeconomic too. I think that's something that, you know, architects tend to uh, not grip their hands into that like economic driver of resiliency. And I think if we look at sustainability, we have to look at all aspects of it. And so we're pushing on that, um, you know, technology, the kind of implications of what BIM is looking like and, you know, what are digital twins? How are we using them? What information do we share with our clients? Can we give them an, you know, an operational model to use to serve the life of the building beyond, you know, that traditional set? All those kind of uh, evolutionary processes of architecture has been really interesting to be part of and, and you know, computational design and getting really into data analytics and how that drives design. There's a, a lot of big topics that we're tackling and it's kind of exciting because I get to touch all of them. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's really, you know, at the root of it for CRTKL, it's really about the human experience, right? And so, at, you know, kind of what everything we do is rooted in, you know, how are humans impacted 
by what we're doing. And either, you know, that has their correlation to how we're impacting our planet as well, because, you know, obviously there's a, a symbiotic relationship if the, you know, planet is hurting, we're going to be hurting too. So, you know, protecting our resources and all of that. It's, it's an exciting time. I think we're at this really kind of, you know, pivotal moment where we're really advancing around ideas mm -hmm. and not just around subject matter expertise, but really like how does, how can we leverage our thought leadership, our subject matter expertise and apply it to these bigger ideas that impact us all. Amazing. Amazing. B, I think that's the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation. I just want to say this is lovely. A, a massive, massive thank you for giving us that kind of overview and insights into the operations of CRTKL. Um, yeah. It's been really, really fascinating to, to understand. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been really fun. My pleasure. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.